Thank you so much, Vicki. That was wonderful. Now, is this, is this the thing? All right. <laughs> well, let's see if this works. There we go. Oh, I've gone back. Go back one. There we go. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about citizen science um, as a catalyst. So a little bit what Vicki just talked about then, about taking these things that we're doing as citizen science and um, ha a catalyst for change. And basically I'm going to provide you with some insights from, from both local and these international initi initiatives and how impact has occurred from these citizen science-based projects. So of course before I start I'd like to do an acknowledgement to country. Um, we are of course all um, gathered here today on the land of the Gubby Gubby Cubby Cubby people. Um, and I would like to definitely thank them for all the, t the time that they've spent taking care of this land and country and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And I'd also like to pay my respect to all the cus traditional custodians um, on whose lands the projects that all of us have undertaken, and including the places where I've been taking some of these projects, and thank them deeply for walking with me on this journey as we go through and discover new and interesting things. So, a little bit of my personal story. Yes, that is me standing in the mud in my socks because I've lost my boots in the mud. It all started in the mud. Um, like Vicki said, I really engaged with citizen science even before it even had that word. This was actually during my, well, that's not a picture of me in third year. It's a picture of me more recently. But this project happened when I was in third year. And um, we, my supervisor noticed that there were some new, there were some mud skippers that had showed up. And we really were just trying to get an idea of, are they new? Were they there all the time? When did they show up? There had been a big PhD project done, which actually indicated that they didn't have any of these back in uh, the last time they were looked at really closely, which was back in the 70s, I guess it was. And what I did is I reached out to all these people who I thought would probably know. So I reached out to ferry terminal people. I reached out to... Um, teachers who did, were taking their students into the mangroves. I reached out to fishing communities. That, that, that's an advertisement that I put into the local fishing magazines to basically gather information from people who probably knew what may have been going on. And that was really useful. I ended up getting two papers out of that in my third year. Um, again, I wouldn't have known that information. I tapped into local knowledge and recognized that that was a really rich source of information. So that's sort of the start of my story. It started in the mud. I still hang around in the mud occasionally. However, I've got three really big projects that I'm working on that all have a very strong citizen science twist to them. So Project Manta, Turtles in Trouble, and Leaf to Reef. And Leaf to Reef is the most recent one. It takes place at Lady Elliot Island. It has components of um, gathering photographs from uh, people who come and visit the island because we're trying to understand or create a baseline of species that are actually there because we predict as climate changes increases Lady Elliot Island which is the very last reef on the Great Barrier Reef is going to be a bit of an arc it's going to pick up all of those climate refugees as they start to move south and so before we can understand how that that's happening we needed to create a baseline of what's there now. Excitingly, from that particular project, we've already identified new species of fish, which we didn't think was going to happen. We're working with Mark Erdman, who is a world expert in um, uh, fish taxonomy, and we've definitely identified a new species of shrimp goby, which is um, Tomiechthys um, aliensi. You may have seen it in the news recently. It's not very excited about it. Um, but we've got at least another four, possibly five new species as well. And so this is, again, all of this from working with citizen science. So that's, that's the, my three big projects that I'm working on. However, there's a whole bunch of other projects, particularly my students are working on. So I have quite a large lab. I have 14 PhD students. I have two postdoc students as well. And pretty much all of my students have some sort of citizen science component attached to their project. So Nikki Bisk, whose poster I think is possibly up already, um, she's doing work on the, she's doing work on sawfish, and she's reaching out to the community to get ideas about historic distributions of sawfish throughout Queensland. 
And that's exactly what the posters want. So go and have a look at that if you like. I've got students in the Galapagos who are working with the community to um, identify and get photographs of cetaceans throughout the Galapagos. Because again, a little bit of an unknown. They work, she works really closely with the tourism industry and the, um, the rangers to gather information of not only what kind of, which, which species are there, but how frequently they show up and if things like El Nino and La Nina affect them as well. I literally just got back two days ago from Papua New Guinea um, doing a new project with my um, PhD student Jess Blakeway on the walking sharks on Papua New Guinea, which was, is, oh, it's an amazing project. We're literally going into remote villages, um, speaking to the villagers there, showing them pictures of the sharks, saying, have you seen these sharks before? Uh, and then we go out, collect them, we're, we're measuring them. People are now, we've got a Facebook group that's now in Papua New Guinea, because they love Facebook in Papua New Guinea. Um, and they're now starting to provide us with photos, so a little bit like Project Manta, providing us with photos of individuals. And, we're, and the cool thing about this project is that, again, it's two new species, or two newly identified species of uh, epaulette sharks. And all we knew until this expedition was their name. And now we're getting ideas of habitats, we're getting ideas of their diet, all of those things as well. So that's another one we're working on. Um, also working on manta rays in um, Maldives. So I've got a student who's working on the manta rays in Maldives, as well as working on uh, the manta rays around Gari, which is, of course, um, Fraser Island, which is, again, another really exciting project. And then in, um, I work really closely with Chris Dudgeon, who I'm sure most of you probably know. If those of you don't, may know her. Um, and working with the Spot the Shark program. So she does a lot of work um, on uh, the uh, leopard sharks. And so again, that's another project that I'm involved in. So all of these things, the thing that's a common thread is that there's always a citizen science component attached to it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit of a couple of case studies. So I'm gonna talk you through some of the things that have been happening um, and some of the stuff that I've been doing for the last very long time. <laughs> So first of all, I'm going to talk about Project Manta. Um, and I'm going to see, can I get this to work? Ooh. You do it? Yeah, I think you have to touch this. So this is just a little blurb about Project Manta. We explore distant planets, but know so little about our own oceans. Here, even the largest creatures have been overlooked, like the giant manta ray. Their brains suggest that they are extraordinarily advanced and compare favorably with the highest evolved organisms on the planet. Now a group of scientists is on a mission to reveal the life of this intriguingly smart creature. Exploring manta hotspots around the world, they find astonishing behavior. From these rarely filmed mating trains to one-of-a-kind feeding frenzies, Everything from now on will be new. We know so little that we're guaranteed we're going to be discovering new and exciting things pretty much every time we come out on a field trip. So that's my little blurb for Project Manta. Um, it's a big project. Oh, stop that. Um, it started back in 2008 um, trying to basically ask the basic question, where are these guys? What are they doing? How many are they? Are they endangered? Um, at the time when we started the project, they certainly weren't protected. We knew that they were being targeted for fisheries overseas, including um, potentially in, within Australian waters, um, not, in, not legally, of course. Um, and we really were trying to understand what was happening. And as I said at the time, they weren't protected when we first started this project. And there was actually really nothing in Australia from, off, uh, from stopping a particularly entrepreneurial fisherman to start fishing for manta rays because the, they have a value on the international market because they're, they um, remove the gill breaker. So it's, a, it's considered to be a Chinese medicine. And like the, um, like the shark fin trade, small party part, very high dollar value. Um, so, I worked really closely in the early days with Earthwatch, um, but have sort of continued on with this research project, um, including volunteers for, uh, throughout this time. And the volunteers do a whole bunch of things for us. Of course, they provide 
um, photographs from the photo ID database. So the photographs of the bellies are really important for us. It's a natural tag. We don't have to stick a tag into the animal. We can tell individuals from one another. Um, we've got this large database in which we can compare the, the um, photographs from. Um, we actually get them to join us in the field as well. So they get training on how to be with the manta rays, how to take appropriate photographs. Um, they helped us with data entry and identification. Um, also helped us with plankton collection because we were trying to understand what they were feeding on. Um, and also helping us with acoustic receiver uh, with booster acoustic receiving stations retrieval and um, deployment because we did have some tags on the manta rays with acoustic ones, so we could actually see how they were moving. Um, and I guess really importantly, we have several, and still do to this day, as I said, we started this back in 2008, and still to this day, we have several manta heroes at each of these various key spots where they're continuously providing us with photographs and information that we wouldn't get otherwise. Um, including things like creating a logbook, which gives us really in-depth understanding of when and where these animals are going to be showing up. <clears throat> and just, I just want to, you know, give a bit of a highlight or a bit of a call out there. And you guys will probably understand this too, because you are all working with citizen scientists. The caliber of people that you get involved in these projects is sometimes just absolutely mind-boggling. Like this is everybody sort of snot-faced and wet and gross sitting on the dive boat. But I've got a dedicated conservationist, a world-renowned neurosurgeon who works at the Mayo Clinic, um, a conservation officer, a CEO of an IT company, and a teacher, all sitting side by side, driven by, singularly by the passion of the marine environment, and coming out and spending their very valuable time to come and help us do these types of projects, which is really exciting. So what are some of the outcomes? As I said, we've been doing this since 2008, so 15 years. What are some of the outcomes from this? Well, I have to say I'm pretty proud about this. We, the research that we were able to gather has really done some very big changes. So the first thing, as I said, in the early days, of course, the manta rays in Australia weren't protected. They weren't protected actually even globally. The other thing is that we kind of suspected that they probably were going to be um, uh, have issues as far as being uh, susceptible to extinction because they're slow growing. They only have one pup every, uh, they, they're like pregnant for 13 months. They only have one pup every two years. So they're like a classic cave species. So they're ones that are really susceptible to overfishing and um, uh, population collapse. So I guess some of the things that we did is that we helped to provide the IUCN Red List um, with information which graded from going from um, data deficient to actually vulnerable to extinction. Um, and so that was really important because, there we did, as I said, we did know there was stuff happening globally where these animals were actively being fished. Plus, they get caught in things like... Um, uh, other fishing gear and things like that as well, so they're a bycatch player. After that, we were able to lobby to be able to get them, uh, put them onto the um, uh, Appendix 2 of the International Trade um, Society, so that means that they're now listed and you're no longer allowed to trade their body parts internationally. And finally, that meant that we could actually get them listed on the EBPC Act here in Australia, which means that they're now fully protected here. So no, um, you know, excited fishermen who can now start a, a uh, manta ray fishery. <clears throat> okay, so that's manta rays. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the case study too, which is um, turtles in trouble. I'm going to talk more at depth about this, um, mainly because it's a project that I'm, well, I'm still involved, I'm still doing Project Manta, of course, but this one, to me, I think has had some real genuine societal change. So not just conservation outcomes, but some societal outcomes as well. So just a bit of background, I'm sure everybody knows this, um, that, of course, particularly since Tango Royal Blue is in the room, <laughs> uh, global debris issue. Um, it's a good news, bad news story. We've created this amazing, light, durable material that provides a whole bunch of social and economic benefits. However, we've really doubled our plastic pro um, production in less than 20 years, to over 400 million tons. Um, and only 14% of that consumer waste is being recycled. 
And the, 30, the rest, of 33%, is actually physically lost and escapes. We don't know, well, we do know where it goes. It goes into the ocean, so that's where it ends up. Um, and we know that 4 to 12 million metric tons of this stuff is entering the oceans annually. And what does this mean? Well, this means that there's estimates of around 150 billion tons of plastics circulating around in our oceans right now, and that number is rising. Now, this, uh, this map here is basically a map. Most, most of you probably have heard of the Pacific Rubbish Patch, but I just wanted to show you this. There's basically a Pacific Rubbish Patch in every single ocean in the world. So we have these areas where the debris is collecting around the world. And of course, these are also hotspots of where traditionally pelagic animals are going to be feeding, right? So not, I mean, we're seeing it because it's rubbish, but it would also be collecting fish and um, algae and other things. So it would be a really high um, productivity hotspot. But of course, we're now contaminating that with this plastic as well. So what are the impacts of all this plastic? Well, worldwide, over seven, uh, over 700 species, and this number keeps rising. Like we just did a project in the Galapagos and added another 10 species, and that wasn't on this list before. But over 700 marine species have recorded interacting with marine debris. The two primary ways, well, there's actually three, but I've got two up here. Um, the two primary ways that they interact with debris is either they eat it, so ingestion, they get entangled in it, or the other way is actually disrupting their habitat in one way or another. Um, and turtles, for whatever reason, well, I'll tell you why in a bit, why that is, but turtles are very susceptible to ingestion in marine debris, where, and were actually one of the very first faunal groups all the way back in the 1960s to record having ingested plastic debris, so right from the very start. Which species? All species. Every single species in the world has been recorded either being entangled or ingesting marine debris. Um, we have the dubious honor of being the first lab to record um, ingestion in a flatback turtle. We had a little juvenile that showed up, 100 and something pieces stuck in the gut of that animal, which, which perished, of course. <clears throat> we also asked the question, is there trophic level risks for these animals? So is it just be, we know that all species are ingesting it, but is it have something to do with their habitat? And we found that ones that are omnivorous, herbivorous, and gelatinivores, which of course are our leatherbacks, are the ones that are more susceptible to ingesting marine plastic. And we'll talk about why that might be. But first of all, I want to talk about the effects. It affects all life history cycles. It starts from the hatchling, the smallest, the smallest animal that I've removed plastic from its gut from was a five centimeter hatchling that had a piece of plastic the size of my baby fingernail in its stomach and it perforated the gut and that animal died. It was probably only two weeks old. Um, so everything from the hatchlings to post hatchlings, the lost years are very, very susceptible through to the juveniles all the way up to the big sexually mature ones. Um, is there greater risk at different life stages? In actual fact, there is. So this, the younger they are, the higher the risk they are to ingesting marine debris. As they get bigger and sexually mature, that risk starts to drop down. And I have to say, having looked in many hundreds of sea turtle guts, the reason for that is just pure mechanics. Because as when they're first born or when they're hatchlings, the gastrointestinal tract is maybe a half a centimeter wide. But when they get to be full adults, you know, they've got a gastrointestinal tract that's this sort of size. So that means that things can move through without, with less impact than they would do otherwise. Um, people, particularly in the early days, people were asking me, has the problem got worse? We actually had to go back and do some bit of analysis, some meta-analysis to try to understand this. And the answer is yes, I'm sorry, it's true. Um, the likelihood that green sea turtle has eaten debris has doubled since 1985. So they're, they're much higher risk than they were even back in the 80s. And we estimated that 50% of the world's sea, sea turtle population have consumed marine debris and probably have debris in their gut right now. And that really depends upon regions because another place, as I said, I'm working in, is in Ecuador. We had 100% of the animals that we sampled there had marine debris in their gut. So it really just depends upon where you're looking. Um, 
So where are they getting it from? Well, they're really, we, again, <laughs> this is something, and I'm sure Trey Lovely hears this all the time, and they know oh, it's, not, uh, it's not us, it's coming from China, it's coming from Indonesia, it's everybody else's fault, it's not us. Well, we modeled that, I almost said a bad word, we, <laughs> we modeled that stuff, and it turned out that, no, that's not the case. We're talking like no more than 250 k's away from where that animal actually washed up. So that's, you know, that's Australian waters, right? Um, and we also know that 80% of the debris is land-based. So we know that that's where most of it is coming from. Um, however, you know, if it's uh, originated from only 250 kilometers away, how come isolated beaches are really being impacted? Um, and that's because, oh, I, sorry, I should have gone back there. That's a bit about, that's, that's because of the currents. So the currents are picking these, this stuff is mobile. It doesn't sit in one location. It gets picked up from one location and moved to another location. And I will talk about, I keep dropping, name dropping the Galapagos into this, but it's, that's another example. This is a place that's supposed to be absolutely pristine in the world. And yet it has some of the most staggering levels of marine debris found anywhere else on the planet. And there's very few people that are living there. It's just, it's all washing up on their shorelines. The other thing, and this actually turned out to be probably one of the most important questions. Once we established that this was a problem, this is probably one of the most important questions that we asked. And this is because I'm a pragmatic individual. I knew that we're not gonna be able to to ban every single plastic item. That's not gonna happen. You know, we use, there is not one single one of you who is not, cannot put your hand on some sort of polymer right now, you're sitting on it, you know, it's, it's part of our society. So instead we ask the question, are there selective? Is there certain types of debris that's causing more of an impact than other types? Because if that's the case, we can target what needs to be done. So we basically compared what was found on the beach and compared, compared that to what we could actually find in the guts of the turtles. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, they are really selective and it depends upon life stage. So when they're really young, um, the what's known as the lost years, they're, they're a little bit more generalist. They'll kind of eat everything in that, um, that photograph, that the orange colored photograph really shows you how that works. You know, there's things like there's a bit of thong in there, not the pencils, just to highlight that. I've had people say, I think they swallowed a pencil. That's terrible. No, they didn't swallow the pencil. <laughs> but there's duct tape and all sorts of stuff in there. Um, but really, statistically, what they're really targeting is film-like plastics, the hard plastics and balloons. But when they get a little bit older, so that's when they're out drifting out in the open ocean and basically eating whatever they can come across. But when they come back and change their behavior so that they're feeding, particularly down on the, um, on the algae and the seagrass, then they change their behavior. And it also changes the types of debris that they interact with. They tend to interact more with film-like plastics and balloons instead. And that's because Jellyfish are like crack cocaine to, to all, of the, all of the sea turtles. They will stop what they're doing and go and eat jellyfish. So if there's something that looks like a jellyfish, they'll go and eat it. <clears throat> so again, that's sort of an overview of the stuff that we've been doing. And I just wanted to talk to a little bit about the, the, how the volunteers that we got involved in this project. Um, surprisingly, I got them to assist us with the necropsies, which are the most disgusting job of all, and yet they did it joyfully, and none of them passed out or threw up, so I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and <clears throat> which was, it was actually really good because they had a really um, hands-on experience and could see what was actually going on. Once we opened up the gut, we'd sort through, and I'd, I'd get them to help me sort the rubbish, so what, what we could actually find in the guts of the turtles. Um, and then on top of that, we go and do debris um, surveys on the beach um, and compare that to what was happening with the gut itself. So we get them, I'd help them get them to help me sort it and categorize it from the beach. And again, Tangaroa Blue was amazing because I didn't have to sort out that poop. We just used their protocol and we actually fed all of that information into Tangaroa Blue as well. So it was really great. So moving and working with these other groups. Um, Helped us with data entry, and again, several turtle heroes at key debris spots like Harvey Bay and Stratton and various other places as well. So, 
a bit like Project Vanta. What are some of the outcomes of all this work that we've been doing for all this time? Well, again, this is a really great example where we've got not only members of the general public, but also a whole range of stakeholders engaged. Um, with this particular, with this project in particular, I've worked very closely with the traditional owners of the traditional custodians, both um, in Majeraba and also up in Gari in, in uh, Bachala country. Um, and that's just been so rewarding on many levels. Um, heaps of funding from philanthropists and industry and government. Um, I guess the most important thing is that we were able to quantify the impact at marine debris and identify that kinds of debris that caused the greatest impact. When we first started this project, when I went and approached some of my other colleagues who worked on sea turtles, they said to me, why are you even doing this? It doesn't matter. They just, if they eat it, it just passes through anyway. So there was, even in the scientific community, it was not thought that it was an issue. So we were able to, step by step, prove that it was an issue. And in the area that we are, we're talking like 30% of our sea turtles that are out just, you know, out here in Sunshine Coast, um, Morton Bay and, and Harbour Bay area, they have their consumed marine debris, you know, so much so that that's the primary cause of death. So 30% of the animals that are dying in this region are because of marine debris. We were able to quantify that, be able to provide the evidence for that. We also then identified which were the important um, or the most impactful items. Plastic bags. Yeah, plastic bag ban. So when the plastic bag ban came around and also the container deposit scheme, I was very fortunate to be invited to stand um, at the Senate and various political committees to come and talk about my research and provide evidence to say, hey, yes, this is a problem. And if we do this, 80% of our problems gonna go away. So, <laughs> um, and the same goes with balloons. And so all of these things, um, it's ended up resulting in research that's contributed to legislative change, not here in Australia, but also internationally as well. So our research is being quoted internationally to justify these broader societal and legislative changes as well. And an offshoot from that, again, talking about the amazing volunteers that we have, an offshoot from this is that by, mis by pure coincidence, we've ended up inspiring these other groups of people who've gone off and done their own things. Because I can't do everything, right? So I need, it's, it takes a village or it takes a, a group of people to be able to make some change. And two of the biggest projects that I think that were spurred off of this, were, who were volunteers who've come to work with me, what well, is um, Tangaluma Eco Marines. I don't know if anybody knows about that. Have they, are they here talking about the work that they're doing? They work in schools. Um, I think they've got 250 schools across Queensland that they work with young kids um, about marine debris impacts and, and marine conservation. That's one of the projects I'm really super proud of. Um, and then Turtles in Trouble Rescue, which is a new rescue team that started up in the Harvey Bay region to deal with the huge number of sea turtles that have been stranding after the floods. And that team of women are amazing, holy moly. They have completely transformed that landscape. Um, and yeah, and we're doing all sorts of things together, so much so that we're now actually starting to develop um, a sea turtle rehabilitation and research center in Harvey Bay um, because of these collaborations, not only with them, but also with the Bachelor people as well, which is really exciting. Oh, and here it is there. <laughs> so this is our, hopefully, we're in the process of actually doing this right now. Um, if you want more information, you can scan that little QR code. Um, we are hoping for a ribbon cutting by the end, probably this time at the end of next year, which is super, super exciting. We've been supported by the state and um, state government. Um, yeah, so pretty exciting. So watch this space, um, which also means some new things happening in the future too. All right, so I just wanna finalize some global impacts of plastic and how this has, you know, as I said, ocean currents are dynamic, ocean systems are connected, we're connected across the sea. And not surprisingly, we also have the issue of freshwater inputs, right? And 93% debris, 93 of the debris that we're finding in the, in the marine environment is coming from just 10 rivers. 
um, globally. And so, you know, this is really looking at the source. And I've circled the Ganges here because I've had an opportunity to go to, oh, sorry, I'll go back one. So let's, there's the Ganges. That's the, um, where the Ganges is spreading out. And if you have a look back at our debris map, that's another hotspot internationally, right? Huge amount of debris is coming out of those river systems. And at the very top of that is where Nepal lives. And that's sort of like the source. So it might be weird, but I am actually doing work in Nepal as well. And it's about looking at plastic pollution and its impact at that source. Um, and while they don't have marine debris, and while they don't have marine animals, they have a whole range of other species that are potentially impacted by, um, by this leftover plastic and rubbish. And this is, just, this is photos that I, that I took last time I was there, the cow helping itself. It's very common for them to get um, gut impactions, just like a sea turtle will, because they actually end up pla eating plastic in plastic bags. And again, very painful death. For the Nepalese people, this is not great because to have a cow, to have a goat, to have a bison, that is a source of income. And if it dies because of this sort of thing, it's actually a really big societal impact. Um, so there, again, citizen science, working with the locals there and got this, the students out. It was, it was youth ranging from, I think there were 12 up to 18. Uh, and we went out and we were doing surveys of the debris. And then when I first asked them about where do you think all this stuff is coming from, some of them didn't even notice that there was rubbish anywhere. Others of them said, oh, well, there's an Indian crew that's here doing construction. I think that's where it's coming from. And <laughs> so I took them out. We collected all the debris. We sorted it into categories. And then I asked them again, and not you'll see in a minute what, they, what it consisted of. I asked them again and said, hey, where do you think this might be coming from? And they're like, oh, that's us. That's our stuff. That's, yeah. And the reason being that, you know, 83% of that was like plastic and most of it was packaging from foodstuffs. Um, and, you know, it's 12, and I was able, because we use the same technique or the same methodology as we do when we're here in Australia, we found that it was 12 times the density compared to Morton Bay. Uh, despite being one tenth of the population size of the area that we were working in, um, again the plastic rubbish was the largest contributor. That was the plastic food packaging was the biggest, and then we started to talk about strategies with the youth. We said, "Well, okay, now you know it's an issue. What are some of the things you could potentially do about this? How could they potentially make change?" And we went away and we came back, and when we came back, with great joy on their face, their village was completely clean and all of a sudden they had public waste bins which had never been available previously. Now it's a tiny thing but it was super exciting to see that happen. I'm going to very quickly go through the last bit which is the, the Galapagos marine debris and as I said we started doing marine debris surveys in the Galapagos in 2018 um, and they were where I was back in 2007 where people were even saying, it, they were still saying that's not a problem, it's not an issue, you know. And so they had to start from the very beginning. What was the impact? And what we found was is that many of these really iconic endemic species are being impacted by marine debris and plastic. Um, and, you know, 42% of these are found nowhere else in the world. And we actually found fecal samples from the giant tortoises with basically plastic bags inside their guts. This is another example, sea turtles, surprise, surprise, Ecuador, 100%, every turtle we looked inside of had plastic inside of it. We also had evidence of the, um, these large marine iguanas ingesting debris. Um, sea turtles, iguanas, not, not only macro, but micro debris. The birds, not only eating it, but also using it for their nests. I don't know if you can make that, no. Oh yeah, oh I can do it, there we go. This is a, this is a flightless cormorant. And it's actually, most of its nest is made of debris and it's trying to basically eat a piece of packing tape and its mom quite rightly grabs it and takes it out of its nest. But it's really impacting these animals. So I just, to summarize, I just want to, you know, I've been sort of in this game for a while, as you can tell by my gray hair. It uh, used to be very dark. <laughs> but just some things that I've learned in working with citizen science groups. 
Um, really, you need to make sure you, it's really required to have a dedicated project manager, right? You can't do everything on your own. You really need a team. Um, and as we all know, that's a problem because you need to find money for them, right? And uh, that is a big issue. Um, we need, you need really a two-way responsive communication between the citizen scientists and the research team themselves. You need to be able to talk back and forth. You need a long-term commitment too, you know, because people are expecting to still see you and see you around and be doing the things that you're doing. Work with the community regarding expectations, for example, data collection. Don't make things too complicated. Make it easy, you know, have apps and social media versus, you know, asking them to send you an email and things like that. Um, and the other, uh, other thing that I can highlight to you is that iconic species are a bit of a gateway drug into getting people involved. Like if I had, had marketed my project about marine debris versus turtles in trouble, I probably would have had a little bit more issue around that. Um, and clear messaging, what do you want from your contributors? We need to be breaking down some silos, breaking down barriers between the academic worlds, between the citizen scientists. We drop the ball as academics as far as climate change is concerned. We had been talking about that for 20 years when it became general knowledge and everybody you know, threw their hands into the air and said, what the heck? But we were like, well, what do you mean, what the heck? We've been talking about it for 20 years, but we've been talking to each other. So it's really important that those sorts of communications start early to bring them on the journey. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>